Good morning. Good morning. Um, okay, yes, hello. Nice that. <laughs> Thank you, Tamir. Um, nice to see you here this early morning. It was a late evening for me yesterday trying to prepare today's lab because I have to admit that I've never used interrupts on the 80 mega 32U4 before and I found out an interesting fact which took me about two hours and we will come back to this later because my code I was sure would work and it didn't and it didn't and it didn't and I tried everything until I got the correct idea. Um, yeah, that was, would have been an interesting session to actually record. Um, okay, so today's topic is interrupts and timers and uh, the lab instructions and the data sheet of our new component, which we will use in the second experiment is on Studium. So the magic component is this one here, which is an 8x8 eight eight LED matrix. And uh, so it consists of eight rows of LEDs and eight columns of LEDs. And we will see how we can control these in a similar way to what we did last time with the segmented display. And again, I can tell you that uh, I can absolutely see no flicker on this display. It's a code which we left it with and uh, we will use exactly the same connection for the next experiment now. So we don't have to rewire anything. I can actually remove our green LED, which I put there yesterday to actually get some current consumption in the whole unit. Um, so. Yeah, what I also wanted to show you before we start with the new experiments is this, which I actually had connected up earlier and uh, found yesterday at home. Um, it uses actually a um, Pro Micro here, not my own breakout boards, but a regular Pro Micro. But it is programmed using uh, Atmel Studio, so no Arduino code in here. And this is an LCD display which I picked up on, yeah, on a reseller for cheap. It's a surplus display, it came without any documentation. And uh, you can, if you look at a slanted angle, you could actually see um, what kind of display it is. So how many rows and symbols and, and what it is. Um, it's not as clear as an LED display where you actually normally see the segments, even if they are not on. And uh, so after a lot of testing there I actually figured out what controller it had and actually how to use it. So I uploaded some test code here and uh, I will zoom down a bit and just show you. So this is a segmented display as well. Um, it has, let me see, 16 digits in the upper row. And in the lower row, it has a couple of symbols which look like it was part of a telephone uh, at some point. So you had a calling number up there and then some extra symbols down here. Before the time when all phones actually got graphics displays. Um, but these could be useful for, for some own projects and uh, yeah. And the one interesting thing here is actually that it is controlled by only two wires. There's only two wires going between the display and the microcontroller. And we will have a look into how this is possible later on in the course. Two lectures from now, I think. But uh, back to us and our display here. And if you remember from last time, uh, then we actually have oh, the flicker starts at a certain 
certain distance because of some change in the shutter speed of the camera. Um, the code which we have here is actually the, still the code from the previous lab and it is multiplexing so it shows one digit at a time but it does so at a certain frame rate which for at least for my eyes make it appear as if it was steady. But this is all done in the main loop and this means that our processor is has always to be active Yeah, actually you could actually, Samuel, um, yes, I, you could use these for, for a lot of things, I guess. Um, so the code is was, was in our main loop. We had a for loop um, going through these uh, and then it was all contained in the while loop. But of course um, it would be nice if we in our main program or main loop don't have to care about um, handling the display if this could be put out to a kind of a driver routine for the device and this can be done using timer interrupts because we want to update these in a regular fashion so we want it is this uh, segment to or this digit to light up for a certain amount of time then it should automatically go to the next to the next and to the next and in order to do so, we have yesterday in the lecture seen, or was it already the day before yesterday? I'm a bit confused here. We, we have at least seen that there's something which we call a timer, which can actually do sting things regularly. A timer is a counter which is supported or supplied with a certain regular clock pulse, and then it counts. An 8-bit counter would count from 0 to 255 and then it would restart at zero or roll over to zero and uh, actually we can have an interrupt happening whenever this occurs. And uh, the timer which we want to look into today is timer zero on the 80 megas. And uh, timer zero is an 8-bit timer so in the lab instructions you will find an excerpt of the data sheet which you also find on Studium, the full data sheet but you also find it by googling for it. Um, I didn't put a link up because I put the whole data sheet up. So this is actually um, the description, this is just a part of the whole data sheet describing the register settings of our timer. And in order for the timer to know what we want it to do, there are a couple of 8-bit variables, 8-bit registers, which actually control how the timer is working. And uh, if I move this away a bit here, then I think this is probably as good as me putting it up on the PDF and I might have the possibility to even, if I find a highlighter, let's try highlighting something here. So we, we have actually the symbolic name of our control registers um, here. Actually it's set once more here. We have it for the second register which is of interest which is TCCR0B and then there's some more. Then the data sheet is constructed so that we see all the eight bits in this register and uh, they all have a short couple of letter um, mnemonic uh, or symbol attached to them which should make it easier or the intention is to make it easier for us to understand what these individual bits in this 8-bit number stand for. So we can see this as an 8-bit value but we can also see that the individual bits of the 8-bit number have a certain meaning, control something directly in the hardware. We will today ignore, let me cross them out, 
we will ignore all of these actually well, it's a correct data sheet exactly so so we will not care about these these come back later but just to show you these are explained in these tables which follow on the same page so the data sheet actually is is like an an index book where we can actually find all the information uh, just in the register description before the register description there is actually a very detailed description on how the timer works so um, it's really worthwhile looking into it and and, uh, uh, and and read it actually Samuel is asking if I know a good resource to learn read data sheets I hope that I can give you um, some ideas on how to read these data sheets and actually I must say again that the ones from microchip Admiral um, they are very good in the respect that uh, they, they have written as a clear text and, and you can just go to the chapter you want the, the structure is quite clear um, and uh, then you have these tables um, which are also quite self-explanatory but let's have a look and see if we can actually read this data sheet together so um, as, as I said, we don't care about the bits which are called COM0A1, COM0A0, COM0B1, COM0B0. Um, the, these we ignore, but we, are, we have bits here which are called WGM01 and 00. So the first number, so the bits are called, let me see, where am I? Here am I. W G M then comes a zero and then comes uh, zero one and two uh, so the first part of the number in this case stands for waveform generation mode yeah, waveform And so actually the inventors of the data sheet came thought that this would be something which we could remember um, WGM waveform generation mode um, it's a control bit telling or control number telling the timer what to do and waveform is perhaps a bit yeah I don't know um, it can be used to generate waveforms but that's something which we will look into later actually but it's a it's a controlled structure at least and then we have the zero the first zero and this means that this is for timer zero in our 80 mega 32 u4 we have five do we have five timers or do we have four timers i forgot that already again um, but we have several timers and they are numbered timer 0, timer 1, timer 2 is absent then comes timer 3 and 4 and I don't know if there was a timer 5 it doesn't matter um, so this number here actually tells us that this particular structure here is for timer 0 and then we have three individual bits which give us eight possible combinations yeah combinations in English is with a C eight combinations of values and these eight combinations they are listed in this table here so in this table we can see that we have eight different ways to use our timer and uh, we have a short description of what these different options are we have something which is called normal we have pwm face correct we have ctc fast pwm reserved pwm face correct reserved and fast pwm so again we have two things which we will ignore because i have no idea and i don't want to test today what happens if we run anything in the reserved modes here 
which leaves us with six where's the other one here leaves us with six rows in this table of usable operation modes for the timer and we will today look at this mode here the normal operation mode and normal means that our timer starts at zero and for every clock signal it gets for every tick it gets it increases its value by one until it runs over after it had reached 255 because the timer itself only has eight bits to store the information in as well and with eight bits we have at maximum 255 um, which we can represent there as an unsigned integer so from this table we can then see what the values for our three bits wgm should be it should be zero 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 because we want to have the first mode the first row here top is the top value of the counter which means it runs up to the value 0xff and uh, then the overflow flag will be set so the overflow interrupt will be executed once it reaches the maximum value that's what this last column means if we just have a look at the third row here there it says ctc that's another timer mode which i presented to you in the lecture which was actually count to timer compare or clear to clear on compare there's the several ways how to interpret this um, it says clear on timer compare match actually here in the descriptive text but you can also say count to the compare value and here you see in the column for the top value instead of having a hex number then like you have for the others you have actually the name of another register and this other register is OCRA um, the output compare register A so there's a different place in memory where we can store an 8-bit number and our counter will count up to the value contained in this register so instead of counting to 255 we can tell it to count to 100 for example by putting it here we cannot call it uh, tell it to count to a number like 500 or so because 500 doesn't fit in an 8-bit register and uh, then we we see the top value is different for for the other modes here as well 0xff or ocra again and uh, so what we can see then is if we look at, at the table first we see that we have three bits wgm2 1 and 0 but in tccr0a we only had wgm01 and 00 so where the heck is wgm02 and why is it not at this position here where it should logically belong well the last question i cannot answer you but the first question I, question i can answer you it's actually the fourth bit or bit number three here in w wg no, in, in in tccr0b so here is our missing bit so we have to actually handle both tccr0b timer control register or timer counter control register that's why it says tcc so we have to handle register a and register b and uh, register b comes of course with with new eight bits so seven other bits than the one which we already identified and uh, there are um, these two upper bits here which are called foc 0a and 0b and we have the lower bits here which are cs02 cs01 and cs00 and uh, well we will ignore the two upper bits so we don't care about these but 
And, and this one we already identified. We want to put a zero there because this is our control bit telling us we're running in normal mode. And then we have the chip, uh, no, the, the clock select. It says, uh, well, it doesn't say, but CS stands for clock select. And we have a group of three bits again, which seem to be belonging together. So in writing it a little bit bigger, so this is CS0. 0, 1, and 2. 0 again stands for timer 0, and then we have bit number 0, bit number 1, and bit number 2. Okay, so how do we know what these bits do? Well, we try to find it in the data sheet, so we browse down, and actually we find it on the next page of the data sheet, and uh, here it is. And this is the table describing the eight possible settings of these three bits. And uh, there we can see that all bits zero means we have no clock source, the timer counter is stopped. That's obviously not what we want to do. And then we have a couple of other options. Um, we can, can run at clock IO, which is equal to FCPU. So our CPU clock. Which means that we are starting off in our case at 8 megahertz. Because our system is running at 8 megahertz. So if we have 001 in this three bits, then our timer is running at the full speed of the instructions of our CPU. So while our CPU is executing instructions, our timer is automatically running and uh, counting at the same speed. We can have it count eight times slower if we divide the clock signal by a factor of eight first. Then we could also divide it by a factor of 64 a factor of 256 and a factor of 1024. And then in the end, we can actually have an external clock signal attached to one particular pin, which is pin T0, on the outside of our package. And our counter would count the signals on this pin. And it would count either on the falling edge or on the rising edge of this clock. So, so a falling edge means that it counts when we are going from a logical 1 to a logical 0. And a rising edge means that we are going from a logical 0 to a logical 1 on this particular pin. And, uh, but we are not done yet with registers. There are more registers uh, coming which belong to the same timer. We have a register which is called TCNT0. And this is actually the value of the counter. So at any time our program code could go in and read out how far has our, time, our, our timer counter counted. What's the current value? Could do a lot of interesting things with just this sometimes on, under some circumstances you can actually see these as random numbers because you are at a random part in your, of, of your program code when you read out this and the timer could have any value so you, if you want a r almost random number look at the value of a running counter register we have the output compare register a which we've seen can be used as the top value in our counting we have another output compare register OC0B, which we will also come back to in the next lecture. And we have the timer interrupt mask register, TIMSK0, timer interrupt mask, MSK, mask, okay, I don't know, um, register for timer zero. And this actually allows us to enable an interrupt when a certain event occurs in the timer. And uh, this register has three used bits, as we can see here. There's only three bits which have names. 
and uh, there are two which are called an output compare match interrupt and output output compare match interrupt i've shown you in the logisim simulations what this actually means um, so whenever our timer passes by the value stored in these output compare registers we could actually trigger an interrupt but uh, what we want to do today is actually we want to have the overflow interrupt enabled so whenever our timer reaches its maximum value of 255 we want to actually enable an interrupt we have another register which i've never used myself actually when several interrupts happening at the same time you can in the flag register check which interrupt occurred um, but since they are all connected to different interrupt service routines we actually don't have to do this is there anything else no there's nothing else we're at the end of this section of the data sheet luckily uh, so putting these together now i wonder if <laughs> if, if if some if, if this was too much information overkill or if something actually got through so i have prepared a uh, very few questions copy link address on item pool and the first one is actually related to i lost my zoom here's my zoom um related to exactly these settings now and uh, so i prepared in the lab instructions i prepared a table yeah now my desk is running over here where's the table these are two pages here's the table um so i have a table here which actually um, shows our three CS bits and so the clock prescaler and uh, the division factors which we can play with so we have divided by 1 by 8 by 64 256 and 1024 and we have seen where these bits go um, they go into the WGM 0B register. Can I, can, is, is this possible? Would this be possible to be fitting? Excuse me. I think it is fitting. If we had more real estate <laughs> in our view here so that it would still be legible it would be great so these are the registers of interest and the values of the clock prescaler and uh, my question on item pool let me find my obs as well and uh, document item pool transition and activate the question is so if we now want to run our timer at normal counting mode and a clock rate of 125 kilohertz what would we have to do is this possible i give you four suggestions here of bit settings for this register and now i lost you all again here are you so you see in this table i don't know if you see but the table is in the lab instructions which you have at very high resolution on studium as well um, we are running at a clock speed of eight megahertz and if we don't divide it down then we have eight megahertz don't we as a clock for our microcontroller 
and uh, then we can divide the clock by 8. What would that be? 8 megahertz divided by 8. So only counting every 8th clock cycle. That would of course be a clock of 1 megahertz, wouldn't it? And if we divide this further down by another factor 8, from 8 to 64 is another factor 8. That means that we are at 1 8th of 1, 1 megahertz and 1 8th of 1 megahertz is 1 million divided by 8 is actually 125,000. So here we would have 125 kilohertz as a clock frequency. And uh, then we can divide this 64 by another factor of 4. And 125 divided by 4. I lost my calculators. No, there it is. On 125,000, put it here, divided by 4 is 31,250. 31.25 kilohertz. So this is actually the different clock frequencies for our timer, which we can set by actually choosing one of these division factors. And I already pre-calculated as a check down here. If we divide this further by four, then we are at 7.8 kilohertz or roughly eight kilohertz here. So it's one thousandth of our 8 megahertz which we started with. How comes that we're dividing by powers of 2? That's because it's technically easiest to divide clock frequencies by factors of 2 and so that's why we see these steps realized in, uh, in, in these types of, of settings. We have another column here in, in this table. Um, and this would be how many interrupts per second we get. How often does our timer overflow when we run it at these different settings? Um, let me just have a look at the bar. Uh, so we have 10 answers and 10 agree on even the same, 11, uh, 11 agree on the same answer here. So the clock prescaler should be quite clear by now and the, the only question is where do these bits go and uh, then the other thing is we want also to run in normal mode didn't we and for that we perhaps remember that normal mode was zeros at the WGM positions so it would be zeros here here and here and uh, I assume since all of you who voted so far agree on this that you all agree on the same let's have a look and you all agree agree with me that the correct settings would be to set one zero in i f i fooled you and and i i i i i lured you so of course you you agree with me but the green bar doesn't agree with me um, <laughs> of course, answer D is correct. Um, answer D is correct. It's not the green marked uh, field. Uh, to my excuse, I have to say that this, I put up these questions uh, half, hour, half an hour before we started this morning. So um, we want to have the division by 64. So we want to have 0, 1, 1 here in this register. And we want to have zeros at these positions and we don't care about the rest. So the rest we set as zeros. Exactly correct. And uh, doing this, I will now never find my papers again. <laughs> yeah. we, we have actually solved the first riddle which is normally part of this lab exercise um, because the code which is on Studium is not complete. Um, 
I just here in the background now, I, I will switch over to laptop shared transition. So what, what I have here is just the raw code, which is also contained in the lab instructions and in Studium, uh, on Studium as a separate file. I copy it and then I go to Admit Studio and paste it into my project file here. And so let's have a look at this code from the beginning. Um, I, I tell the compiler here that we have a clock frequency of 8 megahertz. I include three libraries, the avrio.h, which we always include, the delay.h and the interrupt.h, which actually gives us some uh, easier macros to use interrupts. I made a small ASCII drawing of a seven segment display over here. And I actually took the display code. Um, wait a second, is this? I don't know. It looks pretty much inverted to what it should be. It is inverted to what it should be. We will see. We, we, we yeah, another pitfall here. Um, okay, I didn't test this code yesterday. I, I thought it, it it will just run. So um, anyway, um, let's see first here. This is actually what we were dealing with right now. So we have the prepared fields for the registers TCCR0A, 0B, and TIMSK, T-I-M-S-K-0. Then we have a bit of magic uh, code here. And uh, this is an alternative to actually writing the binary numbers, which you just uh, figured out and actually use the names of the bits itself. So in the datasheet, let's have a look again and transition to document without. So in the datasheet, we see that the bits have names like WGM01. It's set in the register description, 0, 1, 0, 0, and 0, 02. And our compiler actually has these names predefined. So if I right click on the WGM01, which is in a nice purple here, and then I can go to implementation and it will tell me where this is implemented. And here it says that WGM is defined as the number one. WGM zero is defined as a number zero. Um, CS zero zero is a number zero. CS zero one is a number one. CS zero two equals the number three. And WGM zero two is the number three, which is actually the bit position in the register. So why did they do this? Why, why did uh, the makers of uh, the library prepare these values for us? Well, it means that we can use the binary shift operator and we can actually take a bit value and shift it a number of positions to the left in order to put together the number which we want to have by just oring together adding together these individual values. And uh, so we found out that we want to have zeros at these positions. So actually this will mo more or less do nothing. It will shift zeros into positions where there are already zeros. So um, this is just a zero. So this complete row here is saying the same as TCCR0A should be zero. So this is identical to just writing TCCR 0a equals zero. It's also the same as writing TCCR 0a equals 
zero b one two three four five six seven eight or it is the same as writing t c c r zero a equals zero x zero zero in hexadecimal all of these four lines here do exactly the same but there is one advantage to this line here and this is that you don't have to remember which of these bits actually are the WGM bits. You only have to remember that they are stored in the register TCCR0A but not at what position because this is actually remembered in the form of this macro WGM00, WGM01. So which of these is more easily readable? And I would definitely say the first one is more easily accessible. Um, if you want to understand what the code is doing, than just seeing something like this or something like this. If you look at the other register, which is prepared here, TCCR0B, there I put question marks at WGM02 cs02 cs01 and cs00 so we now know that we want to uh, have a zero at the position of the wgm02 bit and we want to have a zero at the position of the w uh, the cs02 bit let me go back to our table here our table here so we want to we want to, what do we want to? Help, lost my ruler. Uh, okay, it doesn't matter. Oh, a highlighter is easier. So we want to set this value here, 150, 125 kilohertz. That means that we actually have to uh, put 0, 1, 1 into the positions of CS02, CS01 and CS00. So back to our code. That would mean that we put a zero here, a one here, and a one here. What this will do is this is a one and this is a value of zero. So here we shift a one, one position to the left. So this one becomes a one zero. And this is exactly what we want to have um, at this position here. And then we take another one and shift it by zero positions to the left, which means it stays at the same place. And that means that we are putting together the number one one here. So this row here is exactly it identical to writing a decimal three or a hexadecimal three or a zero B one one semicolon. We will play around with these registers in a second and, and see how they affect then uh, what our whole thing is doing. The the, th the row of this code, which cost me two hours of yesterday evening and debugging, is this row here. Because my code never worked, the interrupts never worked as intended, uh, the, the controller got stuck and uh, didn't execute my code. And this was because, for some reason, the USB interrupts are enabled by default when you start up the microcontroller at least after running through our bootload uh, reset routine it could be that it's caused by this i'm not completely sure and since i didn't use usb but my computer is always trying to talk and it sees there's a usb device connected to a usb port and then the pc will all the time check if there is something um, to be done with this USB device and uh, then it actually ended up in an interrupt service routine which was not defined and since this was not defined it ran into some random piece of 
a flash memory filled with random instructions and uh, yeah just got stuck somewhere so in order for interrupts to work on this particular microcontroller we always have to make sure that if we are not using the USB interface that we disable all USB interrupts and we do this by writing a zero to the register U D I E N uh, it's U stands for USB, D I have no idea, um, interrupt enable, I E N. And uh, so a zero there actually makes things possible. And then here we have the command which allows to run interrupts at all. And this is set interrupt enable, which actually will enable global interrupts. What I jumped over now is actually this register here, which is the TIMSK register t-i-m-s-k which we also had in our data sheet and it's brought me back to the data sheet here i said we want to have a timer counter overflow interrupt and this means that we have to enable the bit t-o-i-e-0 and if we look here um, this bit is the last bit here so we want to have a one at this position and we want to have zeros at the other two positions the shifting operators i tried also to explain in the uh, snippets um, document which you will find on studium and in the very first on the very first pages of the lab instructions itself so um, I see it's two minutes past nine, but let's let's least at least uh, get this code compiled and uh, see what it does before we take a break. Um, so this is actually this is uh, the function in it. It takes no arguments and it gives back no arguments, but it makes sure that we initialize the hardware. Oh, one thing which I didn't do and show you and talk about is uh, going back to what we did last time. And this is actually to enable the output functions of our port pins here. And uh, we can do this quite simply by saying that we want all port pins as outputs. So we put in eight ones in either register. So this would be one, 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 eight ones here and eight ones here, just filling up to the same level. And uh, so then we have the int main void here and uh, then actually uh, we have uh, in the in there i define a outer variable or a, a global signal not it's not global a local variable count which i start and initialize at zero i for some reason define a variable dummy here we will see what that does later on as well and here i call the init routine which then does all of this and enables the interrupts and then I have my main loop my, my my infinite loop here I see there's something in the chat <laughs> yeah it would be Teja um, uh, it, it would be and 255 and 0xff is also um, shorter than writing eight ones here especially since I have to count the eight ones as well um, but I want to show that we, I, I want to highlight, to emphasize that we actually can write binary numbers in our C compiler. And we will see the, the tilde operator in a second as well in action, I believe. Um, well, let's uh, see what this main routine here does. Now we don't look into details. It just, you see that nowhere in the main routine I am doing anything with the output ports. If you remember how we actually can put stuff out from our microcontroller, interact with the outside world, we had the three registers DDR, 
which is a data direction register for the GPIO ports. We have the PIN, the input register for the ports, and we have the port register for the ports. Um, transition over. So in order to use port D, for example, uh, we have the DDRD, which is the data directions. We have the PIND, which is the input. So what value do we see on the pins? And we have the port D register, which is for getting data out of our microcontroller to actually making the LEDs light up or not. And you see that uh, in the main loop, in this infinite loop, I use neither of these. So I do nothing to the display. But we have another piece of code here, and this is the interrupt service routine. And here you see port Bs and port Ds. So here something is supposed to be happening. And when is this supposed to be happening? This is supposed to be happening every time our timer runs over. Yo, oh, sorry, 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 sorry. Oh, yeah, my, my bad here. So we have the interrupt service routine here. <laughs> Getting. I, I need a break as well. I, I just wanted to compile this code before the break. Um, ah, <laughs> sorry. Um, so we have we have the port and port B and port D registers here. So we are doing something here. And there was some question about the percent operation. Is it slower? Um, why not percent operation? Um, I don't know where you mean um, like, like here or like I don't know where. Um, I just want to show different ways of doing stuff uh, here. Um, but there, uh, this is by no means the best and optimized code. It's just and it's not because it's slower or faster. It's just that I show I want to show everyone different ways of doing things in our C code because I know that many of you are not familiar with C in much detail. And uh, so to get you to give you some inspirations and some points to start testing your own stuff. Let's see if this code compiles. <laughs> And uh, let's see if this code compiles and compiles. Uh, it uses 554 bytes of program memory and it uses 15 bytes of data memory. Okay, that, that's, that's okay, that's not too much and we can definitely afford it. It's 1.7% of the flash and 0.6% of the data memory which we have available. So we, we could definitely do more complicated stuff than this. And let's see what happens if we program this code, if, if we are able to program this code first. Um, so I go, I have my AVR Dudas here, as you can see. I transition so that you can see what happens. I put our microcontroller into bootloader mode by double clicking. And I program. And perhaps something will work or perhaps something. Yeah, it works. <laughs> and it works as I expected. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah. So as you can see, there are some very weird things showing up on our displays here. And uh, I give you 10 minutes to think about, to, to relax and think about what you see here on this display. Look at the code, look at this, ask questions, um, get a coffee. I don't know. I, I have still my cold coffee from before um, here. So I will <laughs> drink my cold coffee and catch some breath. For 10 minutes. <laughs> Try to at least. 
you you see i mean th there's something happening very fast here a uh, little bit slower here even slower here and there's nothing happened here yet um, but it's soon to happen yes here now something happened even here what what kind of weird code is this I, I zoom in a bit so that you see this a little bit better focus focus and yes i know that the wires are a bit in the way here cannot see all the digits clearly now you could and i can also tell you that it was not on purpose <laughs> I didn't think of this yesterday. But when I looked at the program code a little bit earlier, now I saw why and what. Can I... Can I... get these closer together? <laughs> it, it looks something like this, yes. And I, I would strongly suggest not having something like this in your hand luggage when you are traveling on an airplane. I don't know if it's better in the checked-in luggage, though. There's a lot of wires in your bags. I've actually heard this comment at the safety checks at the airport. <laughs> Did I say this? Did I say this, Guru? Uh, <laughs> it, it could be that I... Uh, yeah, exactly. So if, if the font is inverted, then this would be a three here, wouldn't it? And this would be a one. And now it's actually a two. There's still a three here and it will take some time before this changes. Um, now we have the three here. Three, three something. Now we have a four, three, four something. Now we have a five. Now we have a six. Now we have everything lit apart from the seven. So it's a seven. Now everything is dark. This is an eight. Now this turns on. It's a nine. And now we will have a roll over and something will happen here. This is a four and a zero. And you're absolutely right, Guru. And this is actually what I then wanted to get back. That someone, who was it, who commented on the tilde before that tilde zero. Teja wrote that tilde zero would be easier to write, faster to write than actually writing um, all once. Um, and I will show this in five minutes or so. Until then, we, we enjoy the counting. And you can have, if, if you, those of you who are here and don't need a break, you can look at the code inside the while loop and try to understand what's happening there with all these percent divide by um, count plus plus dummy <sighs> and 
And in the meantime, I will try to find four more green wires here on my desk. One, two, three, four. That was easy. Of course, in a real world example, you would put most of this code then also into functions and just make sure that you print out the number which you want to. And, and then you will probably, if, if, you, uh, if you're in a company using the same type of displays over and over again in several projects, you will actually outload this code into your own library which you then will include into your next project and into your next project um, if you are doing a one-off like here in the labs you can put everything happily in into the main dot c or whatever you call your main file um, that's as efficient as anything else then there's also if, if you think about programming principles um, the idea that essentially every every dot c file should have a dot h file um, doing all the declarations in order to be safe and uh, checkable and provable make provable code um, i think for a small project like this this would really be an overkill but if you're working at a company, it might be a company policy to actually do this and then you we'll have to do it. Um, but actually, I've, I've seen very few people making .h files for their main files, but uh, there certainly are. And of course, we could also make an object around it and put it into a C++ file if we wanted to. Object LED display. LED display method write puts out something like this. Everything is possible. And the uh, question is if it is reasonable. I see some advantages with absolutely some advantages with objects and C++ but not necessarily for our simple projects like this. And I've not even see, seen many computer science students in this course going so far as to make objects. As I perhaps mentioned yesterday already, interrupt routines like this one now is more or less an, an exemption um, from from the rule when it comes to most projects because as you have seen we could do the same thing completely without as well we could do all of this in in the main itself and it would work almost as good but we would have to take care of that actually we don't forget to update the display and go to the next digit to the next digit to the next digit in regular intervals um, while here now this is completely done in the interrupt service routine we, we don't care about this in our main our main just does the counting and filling the so-called frame buffer and uh, with this, it's it's already. Now we actually have an eight at the first position here, so let's wait until the roll over back to zero. So the next one would be now we have a nine here. Now we get a nine here as well. So we have a dark nine, <laughs> the the middle red uh, colored nine. And it starts counting here. Now we have one. Now we have an inverted two. An inverted three.
n inverted 4. When it rolls over, we, we continue. And then we'll try to adjust this so that we get a nicer looking, a real looking counter. Now we have the 6. Next one will be 7. So we will have a, a small T showing up. Yes, it's a, it's a T. The 8 next will have everything dark. Then the 9 will show up as this segment here lit up there. And now it will roll over to 0, 0 again. So we have a 0 here, we have a 0 here. And here came the suggestion by Guru um, to actually use the tilde operator to invert our bits. And uh, so we can do it at two places. We could actually invert the bits at the point where we write them to the display, or we can invert the bits where we write it from the font, so from the predefined patterns uh, for the numbers into the frame buffer. So I can put the tilde operator in front of here, which will turn every bit into its opposite. So if a bit is a 1, it will become a 0. If a bit is a 0, it will become a 1. And compiling this code and uploading this code. Wait a second, where is Avian Dudes? It's here. Gives us a counter three four five the the last digit is counting so fast that we cannot really distinguish it but now it's zero one six zero one seven zero one nine and so on so let's make it count a little bit slower so that we can see what happens on the last digit as well and so the counting is done in the variable count plus plus here. It counts up to um, 9999 because that's the highest number we could fit onto this screen. And uh, here you actually can see two different ways of how I can set a top value for my own counting. I can have this if sentence here or I can have the percent operator here. Um, so let's make it a little bit faster, count, uh, slower counting, I mean, um, let's let it wait 200 milliseconds each time I transition you over here. And where is Avia Dudes now again? I need more screen surface here. So now you can see how this is counting. It's counting uh, five numbers per second roughly. And then this should count every second second. <laughs> and this should count 20 of seconds and so on. It's probably not very accurate because we don't care about the time it takes for, for some part of the uh, code to run. Um, let me find this here. So I have another question on item pool. Um, let me see. I have actually several questions now about our um, interrupt service routine, partly related to things which might or might not have happened when I prepared this code. Um, let me see. Uh, we go to document and item pool and transition here. So my first question is, there's something missing in the uh, code up there. Um, what's missing? Two options.
looks good. <laughs> it's not a trick question. It could be a simple. Can you share the link to the page again? Uh, yes, uh, it's also the one which you see up there, but instead of typing, uh, I can copy and paste it in. Oh yeah, thank you, Guru, you were faster. Um, <laughs> yes. Did I see? No, I didn't see. I thought I saw the other option being chosen. And well, you could argue perhaps, I mean, there, there is right and wrong and uh, good and bad practice and readable code or not readable code. But uh, yes, I of course, uh, I forgot the semicolon um, at, after the digit plus plus, because in C, of course, every single instruction has to be terminated by a semicolon. Otherwise, our compiler will put out an error message uh, normally. That's, don't think there's any way that it could do anything wrong, especially and particular in, in this piece of code here. Let, let me see. Oh, big finger. <laughs> That's a big finger. Um, something, something more pointy. Uh, so so in, in this part of code here, uh, yes, you have to finish off this line with a semicolon, of course. Um, so my next question regarding the same piece of code. Um, I defined the variable digit as static uint. Do you have any idea what static could mean? Does it mean that the, the variable has a constant value or does it mean that it keeps its value it's a local variable. It's only defined within the interrupt service routine. But does it keep its value when it when we leave the function and then return later on with the next interrupt, perhaps? I didn't talk about the static keyword before. Um, it would have been part of the lecture about C programming language and it's described in the snippets file again which you will find on student portal and I probably should put it a better link it's a bit hidden now it's in the lecture three I think yeah lecture three um, module uh, you will find this file and uh, I, I will actually have to update it a bit because it so far only reflects the 80 mega 32.8 in all the examples and not the 32U4 which we are using this year. But uh, most of the things are very similar. So that's why it, it's still valid and, and working. Okay, we have, did I put up three options? Oh yeah! It, it also sets a range of the local variable digit is it's, it's the third option. Yes, <laughs> I forgot that I put three options there. <laughs> okay. And nine, ten, three, one. Okay. Let's see what you say. And uh, yes, the majority was right. I, I mean, this is something I'm, I'm not expecting you to know this and that's why I use these different parts in the code which I present to you. Um, where am I? Where am I? I'm here. I'm sitting on my chair. Oh yeah, that's true. Um, I want to go to the... Oh, both of them are same now. Okay. Uh, I want to just show you the code again here in, in this editor. So this is the interrupt service routine. And uh, in order to go from digit to digit, so from number to number, from position to position on the display, I actually use the variable digit to tell the system which is the position which we are interested in right now. But inside the interrupt service routine, I only want to show uh, one digit at a time, actually starting from the right and then going to the left. 
and uh, so in order to remember where I was uh, I, I know I need to have a variable which reflects where I was in the iteration before and there are two ways to do this you could either have a global variable like the contents of the display that's a global variable that's our um, frame buffer variable here and uh, but I decided to use a, a local variable which is only valid inside the interrupt service routine but the static keyword tells the compiler to remember and always use the same variable so if we return to the same um, interrupt service routine with the next timer overflow it will know what the value of digit was from the time before and so it's updated here by plus plus we add one to it. oh yeah now i actually revealed the next i re just revealed the next item pool questions answer <laughs> Um, so I, I will jump over this one and uh, <laughs> give you just the last one. So the question is, and and yeah, the the, the question it might be, yeah, why 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 not? Why not? Why not? Um, is it the right one? I don't know. Wait a second, I lost myself here again. Yeah, it's it's the right one. Um, what does constant value mean? A constant value would be a variable which is not variable but a constant value which we never could change. Um, so for example the font in the code, I didn't define it as constant but I will come back to this in later examples. But if you look at this, this is the font defining which segments to light up for a 0, for a 1, for a 2, for a 3, for a 4 and so on. These were the same patterns which we used uh, last time as well. So um, you can see we have the 7 segments plus a dot here and actually a 0 means that the, current, uh, the corresponding LED is switched on. This is never supposed to be changed. So we could actually put a const before and this will actually tell the compiler that whenever I try to change a value in this table here from my program code that I'm doing something which I probably didn't intend to do and it will produce a warning when compiling the code. Uh, so this is marking that this is something which shouldn't be touched um, it's more an indication than actually doing something special to it. We will later see how we actually can move all this information into a place where we cannot change it, namely in the flash memory, which then will actually save some memory for us as well. Um, but we will see all this later. Um, but uh, so my, my next question here would be about the last row in the interrupt service routine and so what does this digit percent four do what, what does this percent sign actually do <laughs> and uh, yeah I, 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 I'm very well aware of that I revealed the answer already so still I mean I want you to do something as well <laughs> and if it's just clicking something in the answer field. It keeps your mind busy and gives you new stimuli. Um, before we in a second actually will connect this one. 15. How many are we? Um, now actually I saw that we, yeah 21 okay minus minus myself it's 20 okay um, let's finish and reveal this question and yes so it's the remainder of the division by four and if we divide a number by four uh, well if it's not evenly divisible by 4, which would be a reminder of 0, we only can get reminders of 1, 2 and 3. 
and so this is a way to actually make sure that a running variable stays within a certain range and you you see it quite often used in c code like this first you increment a number and then you do the percent operator on it uh, which actually then uh, yeah brings it in back into the range so if digit was three then digit plus plus would give us a four in this row and then we take the reminder of the division by four and it would be zero so then digit would be zero we go back and next time we come in we go in with a zero the zero is incremented by one to become a one one modulo four is actually one and we leave it again with a one with a two with a three then it would be incremented to a four becomes a zero again so we we go through this with zero one two and three all the time and this is because we just have four positions on our display so this is position zero one two three I was black out on the screen so we have and yes I have the item pool in the way here so get rid of the item pool there so we have number zero one two and three here on the display and actually yes this small piece of red plastic does wonders uh, to the readability but it, it's not perfect yet I'll be working on that and uh, so but it's it's much easier if, if you had if you were here if you were sitting here or if you had it on your own desk you would clearly see the numbers even without this trick of red plastic in front of it okay um, second part of today now is actually the dot matrix and uh, this is actually we will be using almost the identical code I want to have zoom back but I want to now connect this display here and in the lab instructions wait a second oh, well. oh I, <laughs> I I printed out I, I just wanted to find the document on my computer no way I, I printed out this this whole bunch of paper for exactly this reason so that I could quickly take up the corresponding piece um, of course now the lab instructions look like this and I have to find the correct page anyway um, in the whole bunch of paper here here it is so the data sheet of this dot matrix display is also on studium and uh, so it has actually 16 pins it has two rows of eight pins and uh, if you put it with the text looking at you um, I could have indicated this in some way on this picture I will update this picture and, and show that the text is actually um, down here um, so here it says what who the manufacturer is lucky light is the manufacturer of this display and it's a kwm-2882 cvb so this is the full name of the display and uh, here you see the layout of the diets the leds inside this 8x8 matrix and uh, here you see the connections uh, marked out at the edges so we, we have this row of contacts which is number 16 down to number 9 and we have number 1 to number 8 and here it tells me and you later what to connect where so we have our resistors and pd4 pd5 pd6 pd7 our resistors PD0, PD1, PD2, PD3 so this is exactly the same layout that we already have here we have the port D pins in blue going through the resistors and then coming back as the white here so these white ones go to these places 
And then we have PB4 to 7 and PB0 to PB3. And then actually the PDs will be the columns and the PBs will be the rows of the matrix. And uh, let me see, it should fit nicely all on this board here and I will disconnect the USB and move everything into our field of view. And so I disconnect the white wires now from the seven segment display. Ah, stuck. I take off the display first and I can reach the cables a little bit better like this. So. So, and uh, when I put the white and the blue cables in, I ordered them. So the leftmost here is actually PD0 and the rightmost is PD7. So where does PD0 go? PD0 goes to the fifth pin on the lower side. This is here. And then we have PD1 going to number six, PD2 going to number seven, and PD3 going to number eight. Then we have the, the other white cables here where we have now PD4 and putting it down so that you see what I'm doing. I, one cable fell off, of course. PD4 goes to the very first pin on the upper side which is pin number 16, then comes pin number 15, then come pin number 14 and pin number 13. Um, for some historical reason, um, these pins on these packages are always numbered, increasing from left to right on the bottom row and then decrease, uh, increasing from right to left on the top row. So they're in a counterclockwise circle. And this is even true for a square package like this, where the pin numbering starts at one point and then, then goes counterclockwise around the package. Uh, things get more complicated if you come to um, chips which have a matrix of pins like this processor here. Um, I have actually seen different ways where you have rows and columns and, and different things. In this particular, it, it's even worse because you have them offset to each other as well. So it's, I don't know how they would be num numbered, but I don't care. Um, so then we have now um, B to connect B0. Right, I take all of these green wires out. Eh like this. We want to have B0, the leftmost pin uh, of the B port on our chip here, um, connected to the leftmost pin over here. That could actually be done with a short cable, I guess. Yeah, it's long enough, yes. And if this is long enough for this, then actually since all the cables are equally long. It will also be the case for this one, for PB2 and PB3. No, this was PB4. This is PB3 going all the way here like this. And now we want to have PB4 to 7 connected to the remaining pins up here of the display. So we go and connect PB4 here, PB5 here, PB6 here and PB7 here. Okay. That should be it. That should be it from the hardware. So everything else now should be again software. And I will connect power. And actually we, we see that we see something. There's some magic garbage happening on our display. Um, switching this off again and perhaps even 
Does it have to? I don't know. Does it increase readability? I don't know. Um, there's something happening and there's something happening. Um, where's my pointer pen? I don't know. I lost my, here's my pointer pen. So we have something happening here and here and here. And of course we are still running our code inside our microcontroller, which was displaying numbers on this display here. But now instead of having segments, we have individual uh, LED dots. So we, we see a pattern here and this pattern is actually the binary corresponding to the binary numbers of the corresponding uh, position of the display. Um, the only thing which we want to do and change now is actually that we want to output um, yeah, something which looks nice on a display like this. And I mean this pattern, well, it, it looks certainly interesting and could be the um, background of a science fiction movie from the 1970s or so, uh, but it's not what we want to do. So I will copy the second code snippet which we have here into Atmel Studio and give you the view of what I'm doing now again. So slide shared here. So this code has done it. This is a new code. Um, not much happened. Um, we again can have a look at the code. Uh, so just briefly going through. Uh, we again tell the system that we are running at 8 megahertz. We are including io.h, delay.h and interrupt.h. We have a different font now. Um, this is actually what is written here as a font. But what does these numbers mean and who put them there and why? I, 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 we will see. <laughs> um, then we have again a so-called frame buffer. This actually should contain then the information which our interrupt service routine puts out onto the display. And uh, frame buffer is just a common name for something like this, which actually is a representation in the memory of the microcontroller of a pattern on a screen. And uh, so, yeah, it, frame buffer. Uh, this time the field has a size of 8 and this is because we have and now I have to think whether we are talking columns or rows here um, but it's 8 words uh, times 8 bits. So um, yeah so each of these rows here is a or each of these columns sorry is a byte with 8 bit positions. And uh, so we, we have a byte 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 and 7 or the other way around. I don't know which one is 0 and which one is 7 actually right now. I'm a bit, I'm a bit confused and we will see in a second what happens. Otherwise the interrupt service routine looks exactly the same as before. So there's nothing new here. Um, the only difference is that we have now a percent eight here. So we are running our digit counter from zero to seven. Once it reaches eight, it's reset to zero. Um, of course, I could do this with an if sentence as well, but um, I, I don't. Um, actually, the percent operator should be faster than any if sentence. There was a question actually um, Samuel asked earlier, why not percent operation? Is it slower? Um, actually, I, I, I'm not sure. And uh, it would be an interesting thing to actually time the different options which we have to do this. Um, could, could be something to be done. Um, we want to have our ports B and D. So port B in green and port D in blue here. We want to have all of the eight bits of both ports as outputs. So instead of a question mark here, we should put zero X and now I write it in hexadecimal FF and 
zero x f f. Uh, I think it has to be a small x. I'm not completely sure. And uh, then we have our timer here. And uh, sorry, this is a bit mangled. It happens sometimes when you copy the code into Atmel Studio that the indentation isn't copied correctly. And we just remember the settings which we used before because as we can see here live, actually it seems to work with these settings. There seems to be a steady display. What we haven't done t earlier is actually play around with the frequency. We will do this here. So um, I remember that the WGM bits were supposed to be zero. And I remember that our clock select bits were zero, one, and one. And we also enabled the output interrupt, uh, the over sorry, the overflow interrupt, and we don't we are not interested in the other two interrupts. So we set these bits to zero. We disable the USB interrupts again. It was actually this which I tested yesterday and it didn't work and it didn't work and it didn't work until I realized why it didn't work. And uh, then we enable all interrupts globally. So everything is enabled, but the only global interrupt or the only interrupt which should be enabled right now is our timer overflow interrupt. And then we have an int main here which obviously does something and we will not look into detail right now what this is it does something to the frame buffer that's for sure um, so it puts something from the font into the frame buffer and it does so inside the endless while loop but there's no access to the ports so everything which we see on the display must happen inside the interrupt service routine I'm curious to see if this compiles and and yes it does it uses less memory than the previous code I'm a bit surprised but that must be because the the part here in the main is a bit shorter what else do we see it's it, it uses 69 bits of our data memory and this is actually almost three percent of the available memory so, so uh, we, we are getting close to our limit here no not at all but yeah it's we are much more limited in data memory than we are in program memory and so let's see what happens if i transition you no you you should see that i take up uh, avia do this here it's still the same file because I didn't change the project. So it's still the same hex file, which I want to upload. So I will press the program button after I have double clicked um, the button here. And before I do so, I will bring you closer again to our project here. That should be about focused. I will find my way through the cables to our reset button and uh, then I will double click here and I will program oh yes yes So now, now my last question on item pool is what, what, what's wrong with this display? Um, hmm. Wait a second, wait a second, wait a second. Document item pool. There's something wrong with the display here, obviously. <laughs> but is, is it, is it uh, mirrored or is it upside down or is it upside down and mirrored? <laughs> I will not reveal to you today and here and now how we could turn it around. This is something which you can then try out once you get your boxes. And yes, I have still not gotten an answer from ElectroKit uh, as of 8 o'clock this morning. Um, I sent them another reminder. I want to know when we can reach the boxes. Okay, we have some answers coming in. Let me see. Uh, six against three, okay. 
seven against three. Seven against four. Interesting. Okay, uh, let me reveal the correct answer according to item pool. Um, and let me reveal the correct answer by just turning it around. So it's upside down. It's not mirrored, it's upside down. And uh, there is a distinguishing, there is a difference between upside down and mirrored here. But it will be up to you to actually figure out how we could change it. Uh, Gur wants me to uh, count instead from seven to zero. Um, oh, okay, no, this is already, this. I think Guru means this is already the answer to how we turn it around. As I said, I will not do that now. Um, what I want to do is I want to play around. I want to show you what happens if we change our timer settings. And particularly if we change the prescaler of the timer. So if we go back to our code, uh, we had the three bits which were the clock prescaler. And uh, there was this question also yesterday in the session, uh, what, what is a prescaler? Um, so if I swap over here again, um, we have the possibility to run the timer at the full clock speed of our CPU at 1 eighth. Right now we are running at 1 64th. We can also divide it by 256 or by 1024. And uh, what we didn't look in or calculate in detail is how many interrupts per second this would correspond to. If we run the timer at 8 megahertz, it will run from 0 to 255 with a speed of 8 megahertz. So it will take 8 megahertz divided by 256 uh, cycles before we get an interrupt. And this means we get 31,250 interrupts per second. Divide this by 8, um, 32,000 by 8 would be something around 4,000 interrupts per second. Um, divide this by another 8 gives you something like 500 interrupts per, seconds, uh, per, per second. And then uh, down here we actually see that if we use the, the lowest prescaler, we are as low as 30 interrupts per second. So this one was already pre-calculated for us. And this corresponds to a setting of 101 on the prescaler bits, on the CS bits. So if we go back to the... Oh, now we are, we, we are getting a nice interference pattern again with the shutter speed. So if I switch off this extra light, shutter speed gets slower and we get a steady display again. And uh, so going back to the code, um, 101, if I put this into the CS bits, 101, then I tell the system to actually divide our 8 megahertz by 1024 before feeding it into the timer. And let's see what effect this has on our display here. So it compiles, it's exactly the same size of compiled code. Um, I will transition you over to the display, finding my way through the cables to the reset button here. And ABR do this and Dunk, 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 and program. And dunk. So now actually you see what I see. So this flicker is not an artifact of the camera itself. It actually is what I also see. Um, with every interrupt, we move one column to the left in, in the display here. So 
we can see actually this happens 30 times per second and uh, so we have a, a update rate over the whole display which is too slow for our eyes and we actually can see how the columns are moving with some fantasy we can actually integrate it with our eyes and still see the numbers but uh, this is what happens if we do the multiplexing too slow and this is also an interesting indication then on how often the interrupt service routine is executed so actually at 30 times per second our processor is still getting into the interrupt service routine but at the same time the processor is actually executing because we are dividing by uh, 1024 our processor is executing 256,000 instructions between interrupt service routines so it does something 256,000 instruction cycles and then it jumps into the interrupt service routine does our small thing and then it jumps out of the interrupt service routine again um, so yeah that's it for today um, and uh, I hope I really really hope that you will soon 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 be able to do this yourself I know that you must be tired of my promises about this um, the thing is the labs in the department are actually off limits for us right now so sorry no um, we are not allowed to get you in there um, I'm not allowed to get you in there. there. There's different rules for different departments. Our department says no labs with students on the campus. And uh, I'm, I'm, yeah, so that, that's the rules from my bosses. Uh, the rector has, some, has done, said something, but 